so much to be thankful for. And it is hard sometimes to be thankful. But if we really stop and think of all the blessings that we have here, even the smallest of things, it's, it would be endless saying thank you back to God for all the things that we have. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer.
As we move into our communion time this morning, if you guys um, didn't remember to grab your uh, emblems at the back, they're in little bins by the doors. I forget mine about three quarters of the time, so no judgment if you walk back and get one right now. So this past week on Monday, we had a pretty big time event come through for folks in this area. No, I'm not talking about the total solar eclipse that only takes place in the same place about every 375 years. I'm talking about something even rarer than that. The Purdue Boilermakers men's basketball team made it to the national championship game. Um, I had to give a little bit of a dig there. I grew up in a big IU family, and uh, my, my grandma even had an 8 by 10 picture of the general Bob Knight on her nightstand by her bed. So uh, it, was, it was kind of part of a religion for us, I guess. But, um, but anyways, my son is a junior at Purdue, uh, so I've had to relent a little bit, and uh, I'm definitely a little bit of a fan. I was, I was definitely pulling for them. I wanted them to win that game. But um, after they won the Final Four game against NC State, which I don't know how Kurt feels about that because he lives in North Carolina, but... Um, I, oh, okay, I'll keep, I'll keep it going about communion. Uh, I texted my son to tell him congrats and tell him that I, like, how cool I thought that that was, and he responded with, this is what happiness feels like. I, I thought that was a little bit of a weird thing to say. Um, but after Monday night and after they sadly didn't, didn't come through, I got to thinking about it and I'm like, you know what, it is kind of exactly what happiness is like. It's fleeting and it's temporary. Um, it's a cheap imitation of what we are all really after. And we spend so much time of our lives chasing it. Instead of happiness, whenever we gather around with these emblems, we celebrate something completely different, and it's joy. Joy is permanent, and it's independent of our circumstances. Joy is knowing what Jesus did for us. It's the reason that Paul was singing whenever he was wrongly beaten and imprisoned in Acts 16. It's knowing that Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sin and he hung on a cross like this one and he took our sin on his shoulders. It's knowing that he paid that debt that I could never, I never wanted to pay. And it's knowing that he rose three days later and he defeated death and sin forever. The, the song, I love this song, like, um, I'm no longer a slave to fear, I'm a child of God. It's awesome. We have joy because we know the end of this story. And that's why we get to celebrate this, right? Will you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the awesome gift of Jesus. Thank you for giving us that ability to stand and sing that we are children of God. We love you and we thank you for his sacrifice. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Matthew 26, 26, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom.
Good morning. Ah. Good morning. Welcome to Valley Mills Christian Church. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we want we extend a warm welcome to all of you who are our guests today, whether it's your first Sunday or you haven't been here in a while. Uh, if you are new to Valley Mills Christian Church, we invite you to stop at our uh, welcome center on the left as you go out, and uh, we've got a special gift for you and just a way of connecting with you. If God desires for you to come back and continue to worship here, there's information. Also, next Sunday, this is for anybody and everybody at about mm, 11.30 to about 1 o'clock. We will have a like a newcomer's class or just a newcomer orientation or for any of you that would like to know more about Valley Mills Christian Church, uh, what it's like to have a relationship with God, we call it our starting point luncheon. So we will have child care and there is uh, a different ways you can sign up. Uh, Tanya Gontraman uh, sends out you know electronic emails, e-news, or you can sign up. Uh, there's some tables in the foyer or just come but it would be helpful if we knew how many to expect. We will meet over in classroom one, right before you go into our Family Life Center, right at the end of this worship hour next Sunday. Uh, we'll probably take about a 15 minute pause and then we'll gather together, uh, have a meal together. And uh, after that, the children will be dismissed to childcare and we'll spend about 45 minutes to an hour uh, just doing kind of an introduction to Valley Mills and answering your questions and just uh, trusting God, you know, where your next steps might be. So please sign up for that. We have not had one in several months. And so uh, if you would like to know more about a uh, relationship with Jesus or the church or how you can, you know, grow in your faith or serve him, this is exactly the, the, the luncheon to come to. Also, the previous day, which is next Saturday, uh, April 20th, I'm inviting any of you who would have interest to join me and several others. Uh, we're going, we've got a, a special couple in our church uh, that has some real needs around their home, outside and inside. And this is in the Heartland Crossing area, and we're going to go next Saturday morning from 9 o'clock to 12, and we're going to help them uh, with some things around the home that physically they're not able to do. So Valley Mills, this is a chance to rise up and... Uh, join uh, several others that are going to just do what we do best is to love on each other and show each other the love of God men or women this is next Saturday nine o'clock to 12 in uh, Heartland Crossing uh, it's some people that are in our life group as a matter of fact but we're opening it up to anybody who would like to come if you would like to know more see me I'll be at the uh, outside entrance and I can take your name and information just give me your name and uh, your email or a phone number and I'll be glad to uh, connect with you this week about the details. And at this time, I have my great, great privilege and honor of introducing one of my best friends. Uh, he used to be on staff here as the youth minister, the uh, minister of craziness. He did all kinds of things, wore all kinds of hats. Uh, when we moved in 2007, after I was the worship minister here, um, Robin and I moved to North Carolina. And within a couple of years, Kurt and Jenny also took a ministry in North Carolina, and they've been there ever since, complete with chickens in their backyard and hogs in the garden, like you would, you know, dream of. Uh, but they love God, and they love people, and they have never, never stopped thinking about their time here. And Kurt, you're one of us, and mm -hmm. thank you for coming today and sharing God's Word. Let's welcome Kurt Honigan. Thank you, Dave. A little worried about the okay good the mic worked good <laughs> thank you all for uh letting me be here uh today it's like it's like walking home coming back in home we pulled in the driveway it's like coming back home and uh, i want you all to know i mean we're not here we're not with you guys every sunday we're separated by a few hundred miles um but we absolutely love from the core of who we are we love valley mills it was such a huge part of our lives for eight and a half years. It's amazing just to make you feel old if you were here then. Uh, when we left, 
Rich was a few weeks from being six when we left, so he's five and some change when we left. Uh, Rich is getting ready to turn 22. So I just want to make you all feel really old because I feel old too. Uh, thank you all for letting us be here. It was such a warm reception walking in. Um, I have a torn rotator cuff in my right arm, and it's like even worse now from all the hugs. It's, it's been awesome <laughs> being here with you guys. I, I, um, I love you. It is overwhelming a little bit, um, and I want to I settle my mind, um, and then we're going to get into the text today. So I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for being better to us than we deserve. Father God, thank you that even in spite of our sinfulness, you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. God, I know how you feel about the church, and I know your son loves the church enough he would die for it, and, and, and that one of these days he's coming back for, for his bride. Lord, help us as a part of that family. Help us to not only love you with all that we got, but God, help us to, help us to love the people around us the way we're supposed to. Help us to, to live as walking billboards for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, help us to have a big picture in mind, not, not ourselves in this little blip of eternity, but Father, let us help, help us to have your vision, your eyeballs to see the bigger picture. Father, we love you so much. Help us to honor you today with all that we do think and say. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dustin, it was really funny that you mentioned... Uh, um, the general, and you didn't, you didn't invoke IU, so that was good. Uh, but I, I'll never forget, it was a rainy day. Um, I was, uh, so it was raining. We just finished services, uh, really nasty weather. I, we were running back, and I was getting cars for older ladies and stuff, bringing them up to the front. And I went and got Joan Dykus' car. And I was driving Joan's car back up here, and she had her radio station on, I can't remember, uh, not WLW, the, the other one downtown. Anyway, it was a news talk radio station. And it was breaking news, breaking news that Bobby Knight had been fired. I'm from Kentucky. This was next to the second coming of Jesus Christ, the best <laughs> news I'd ever heard in my life. So I pulled up, got out of her car, and ran in the foyer singing, Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead. <laughs> People were not nearly as excited as I was about this news, but, um, <laughs> yeah, hopes and disappointments, UK basketball, Woo. Anyway, um, funny about basketball, you brought it up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that to launch off of for legacy. I've got a friend of mine. A really good friend of mine in North Carolina, he is a Duke fan. Uh, I mean, he is, uh, uh, he probably even has like Duke underwear. He loves <laughs> Duke. Um, as a Kentucky fan, I'm supposed to hate Duke. Um, and and I, I don't hate Duke. I just hate Christian Leitner. But um, <laughs> I actually respect Duke for what they've been able to accomplish as a small school under Coach K. And so we were talking about when Coach K was coming to the end of his time there at Duke. Um, he, he was talking about legacy, and I wasn't trying to bust his bubble at all. I was just trying to point out the reality. I said, you know what? I do believe that Coach K has a legacy. Look at what the man has amassed over his tenure at, at Duke. I said, but I don't think Duke has a legacy. I said, the next coach will determine if Duke has a legacy. And what I mean by that is one coach did awesome, kind of like UCLA. I mean, what are they now? You know, sorry if you're a UCLA Bruins fan, but... Who cares about UCLA? Anyway, um, the next coach will determine Duke's legacy. And the coach after that will determine Duke's legacy. And if they can keep hanging banners under the, that's what makes a legacy, right? And that's why Kentucky fans are ignorantly crazy about, you know, all the stuff that they've done because that is a legacy. Legacy is not built on one person or one event or one good thing or one good stretch. Legacy is built on something that repeatedly happens time and time again, no matter who's there. And the church's legacy is monumental. It is huge. Today, I want to talk to you about legacy because here's the thing. Church has this, the church, God's body, God's people. They have universally, they have a, an incredible legacy. But guess what? Jesus hasn't come back yet. So that means that it's still going to continue until that time comes. So what is the church going to do until Jesus comes back? And more importantly, to, to kind of put that under a microscope or a, or a magnifying glass, what are you, as a part of that church, going to do to contribute to the legacy of God's kingdom? Because, again, it's not built on one person. It's, it's built on 
a continuing effort, a continuing action. I want to give you some really boring facts real quick. I promise it's, I, they're exciting to me. They might be exciting to you. If they're not, just kind of smile and nod and make it look like you're excited. But I want to give you some facts about the legacy of the church. Christianity has been woven throughout history in the formation of, of Western society. It is undeniably uh, woven into the fabric of, of, of culture in the, Western, in the Western world. The church has been a major sor- a source of social services like schools and medicines, um, an inspiration for art, culture, philosophy, influential, and even in times, p- politics. The teachings of Jesus, such as the parable of the Good Samaritan, are, are among the most important sources of the modern human rights and welfare commonly provided by governments in the West. It goes back to the teachings of Christ. Christian teachings have been used to end slavery as an institution in the 7th century. Uh, Christian Queen uh, Batilda of the Franks was the, the first kingdom in history to begin the process of outlawing slavery, and that was in the 7th century. In the 1200s, Thomas Aquinas declared slavery a sin. Six years after African slavery was outlawed by Great Britain in 1833, Pope Gregory stands up, the head of the Catholic Church, and challenges the Spanish and Portuguese uh, governments to outlaw slavery and makes, a, makes a, a, a universal statement about the church's position on the immorality of, of slavery. The United States eventually outlawed uh, African slavery in, in 1865. That all came about from Christian influence from the influences of Jesus Christ in people's lives. Long-held Christian teachings on sexuality and marriage and family uh, have been influential. Early church fathers advocated against adultery, polygamy, homosexuality, pederasty, bestiality, prostitution, incest, while advocating for the sanctity of marriage. We were the first as believers to make sure that those things that would fight against the, the, the family and the home and marriage were, were denounced. Christianity played a role in ending practices such as human sacrifice, infanticide, polygamy. Christianity in general affected the status of women more so than any other religion in this world by condemning marital infidelity, divorce, incest, polygamy, infanticide, where female infants were, were cast off because they were female and less important than than males, and I got to be honest with you, I have seen it twice personally in my life going to India. Both times I've been to India, we have had a child rescued from a trash heap at a train station. A female child rescued from a trash heap at a, gas, at, at a train station because they don't have value, not, not in Christianity. Official church te- teaching considers women and men to not one be better or, or le- lesser, but complementary. I love the way that it's described as men and women are being equal, yet different. God made them for different reasons and purposes and roles. And women have played prominent roles in Western history throughout and as part of the church, particularly in education and health care. Church preserved literacy in Europe following the, the fall of the Roman Empire. During the Middle Ages, the church replaced the Roman Empire as the unifying force in all of Europe. Many of Europe's universities were founded by the church at that time. The university is generally regarded as uh, having its origin in in medieval Christianity. Renaissance artists such as Raphael and Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, Caravaggio, Titian, they were among a number of artists and innovators who were not just believers but sponsored by the church to create these beautiful works of art that we still look at today. Vivaldi, Bach, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, Mendelssohn are among some of the the most admired Christian-influenced composers in history. Christians have made various contributions to human progress, both historically and in modern times, including science, technology, medicine, fine arts, architecture, politics, literature, music, philanthropy, uh, ethics, uh, philosophy, theater, business. I mean, it's across the board. Our hands are in everything for people who love God. I love this part. Mm. According to 100 years of Nobel Prizes, and this was compiled in the mid Uh, early 2000s, uh, so it's changed since then, but as of 2005, 
uh, according to the last 100 years of the Nobel Peace Prize. Here's the deal. Between 1901 and 2000, 65.4% of Nobel Prize laureates have been identified as Christians in their religion pre religious preferences. Total of 423 prizes. Overall, Christians have won a total of 78.3% of all Nobel Prizes in peace. 72.5% in chemistry, 65.3% in physics, 62% in medicine, and 54% 54, 54 in economics, 49.5% in literature. Christians overwhelmingly are running the, running the table on the Nobel Peace Prize. Why? Is that because they're uh, just uh, in and of themselves, uh, they just happen to be peaceful people, peace-loving people? No, they are influenced by God. And it's that influence that translates into what they do and people recognizing that. Through the efforts of CICM, which is a particular uh, heart to me, uh, being involved with them, uh, six children's homes today currently provide thousands of India's children with uh, uh, not only a home and hope, but also the faith. Blind and deaf schools of India, the leper colony that I got to visit in Merritt, Outside of Delhi, the work of preachers like a guy named Tiharu and, and another guy, Mayor Singh, who rescued Tiharu out of slavery, have, have continued to bring thousands of children out of slavery today. $225 is what it takes to get a kid out of slavery into a home and have them, at the end of uh, four months, have a degree that they can use to go get a job. It's 100 bucks to get them out, $125 to provide them the, uh, the housing and the education to get them a certificate to where they can get a job after they leave the work of folks like Tihavru there in India. Central India, Indians overwhelmingly prefer to go to the church-run hospitals. When God's people, when, when, all right, so when Jesus' people do Jesus' stuff, it makes a difference. And that's the key to it. When Jesus' people do Jesus' stuff, people notice it. A change is affected, and the kingdom is blessed because of it. The cultural influence of the church has been vast. And again, I'll say it, I said it once, I'll say it again, Jesus hadn't come back yet, so that means that the job is still there for us to continue building on the legacy that has been left for us. Now, let's just be honest. Has the church gotten it right all the time, 100% of the time? No, no, we haven't. You can, and, and, and somebody, who is, uh, somebody who is not sympathetic to the church or, or somebody who is uh, you know, looking for reasons to not be a part of, uh, of Christianity, they're going to go through and they're going to list all the stupid, boneheaded, ignorant things that we've done over the past in the name of the church. But here's the great thing about that. When you find out you're doing something stupid, what do you get to do? This is the audience participation portion of today's sermon. When you find out that you've done something stupid, what do you get to do if it doesn't kill you? If the stupid thing doesn't kill you, what do you get to do? Change it. We are saved by grace. Amen. We are recipients of dunk, dump, dump truck loads full of God's mercy. Thankfully, when we do something stupid, we get to confess it, repent of it, and change it. Yes, we've done dumb things, but praise be for God's grace and his mercy. We get to change those things. As a whole, the church has influenced every part of our culture, whether people want to recognize it or not. What are we going to continue to do? So um, before we get into Romans 12, I just want to kind of branch off of, of how things got going. So what is the potential of the church? We kind of get a little glimpse of that in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. It says, all who believed were together had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. This is not as much a plug for uh, communism and socialism as it is to show the heart of the people that were gathering. They had everything in common, which meant they were unified. They were addressing needs that needed to be done. So when Jesus' people see a need and they do Jesus stuff, then the kingdom is blessed because of it. And you can read in Acts chapter 2 how that worked and what that looked like. And that was the potential of the church from its very inception. No one sacrificed like the early church. And those early church, didn't, uh, church members, they, they didn't just give money. They did, but they were generous with everything that they had. You could say that they were radically generous. What would happen, in, 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 what would happen through our, our congregations 
if we were just as radically generous as the first church was. The Bible says that we are stewards or managers of everything that God has given us. It means we're responsible to him for what he has blessed us with. I've got a friend of mine uh, who's no longer with us uh, on this earth. I'll get to see him on the other side one of these days. But I love what he said, that God does not bless us for ourselves. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. We can continue to mirror to show what God's done for us. He didn't give it to us to build a big barn to throw it in. No, he, he blesses us so that we can be a blessing. And that can be money, but it can also be talents and time and resources and treasures and everything else that we have. If we understand that it's God's and how we can use it for the kingdom, it changes what we do and it impacts the kingdom. God doesn't just give you resources for your own enjoyment, but to make a difference in the world. God never blesses us to just sit where we're at. Like Bob Molden says, God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. The church is the only organization in, in, in the world with hundreds of millions of members, with the capacity to mobilize hundreds of millions of volunteers. The church is unrivaled in its capacity. If you want to respond to a massive challenge of meeting needs, uh, you know, local and global, then the church is the organization with the legs to get it done. When you think of a tragedy in your area, whether it's a, a tornado or some kind of flood or something like that, who's the first people on the ground? Christians. Christians. And they may be there through other, other, other entities, uh, firefighters or first responders, things like that. But Christians are the first ones on the scene. And, 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 and think of what you guys have done, even when I was here in, our, in the 2000s, early 2000s, of what we did to meet needs of global disasters or, or, or local disasters. Being in North Carolina, we, let, we have hurricanes all the time. And, and, and whenever there's a hurricane, the church is the first group there. Why? Because they're great and they're, they're, they're just special people who happen to love God more than, or love people more than other, other people? No. They're believers who have been effect, affected by the love of God. They appreciate what God has done for them. They recognize that they're stewards of what God's blessed them with, and they want to be a part of the kingdom work. Church is a huge, has a huge capacity to do a lot. The problem is, unless that compa- capacity is acted upon, it's just stored, right? It's not used. It's, in, it's inactive. And so the church needs to mobilize itself. And it starts with the person in the mirror. When Jesus' people do Jesus' stuff and behave like God's church, the world around his people is undeniably made better and the kingdom advances. Romans chapter 12, we're going to look at uh, four points. And I'm going to be, oh good, you all have a clock. Um, we're going to look at four, we're going to look at four things. Uh, out of Romans chapter 12, uh, the first two verses of Romans chapter 12 say this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what good and acceptable and perfect will. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 tell us in order for us to uh, uh, be a part of, of, of the legacy, to continue to be legacy makers, the first thing we have to do is we are called to change our motives. The very first thing is we have to have a renewing of our minds. The church is not about me. And, and I have a habit. I don't think people are sinning when they say this. I get what they mean, but I've tried to change my verbiage, the way that I say things. I do not refer to Christian Chapel Church Christ where I preach now. I do not refer to it as my church because it ain't. And it's not the people sitting out in the pews church. ain't yours either. It's God's church, amen? amen? And the renewing of mind, part of that includes recognizing that this is not about me. If, if all this is is a, a good meeting where we can feel good about each other and shake hands and that kind of, there's no difference between that and the country club, right? We're not, we're, not, we're not a country club. I tell our folks at Christian Chapel all the time. We are, <laughs> we are the island of misfit toys. You guys remember Rudolph? You remember the Rudolph cartoon? Gosh, I love the Rudolph cartoon. And he had, uh, what is it, Herbie? 
the, 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 the elf that wanted to be a dentist. And so the whole thing's about him trying to be a dentist. And they wind up at that place where all the toys are all jacked up, right? You got like weird eyes and one doll with the eyes stuck open and kind of arm growing out the back. He's like, what is this place? Well, this is all where all the reject toys grow. You know, this is where they put all the reject toys. The church is the island of misfit toys. We're all screwed up. Ain't none of us got it all together. We got warts, wrinkles, baggage. We got stuff that we pray never comes out of our closets, right? We got stuff. We, we are wounded. We are hurt. We are imperfect. And we ain't got it together. And if you think that you aren't that, you are delusional. The only thing that makes us perfect is Jesus Christ. Nothing that we do makes us perfect. Nothing that you do makes you better than anybody else. There is no room for arrogance in Christianity because here's the deal. We're all egg-sucking dog sinners, <laughs> right? Raise your hand if you haven't sinned. If you got like an infant, we're good on that. But as an adult or, you know, a teenager and that kind of stuff, raise your hand if you've never sinned. Okay, you're an egg-sucking dog sinner, which means that you're just as bad as the guy sitting next to you. And you're just as bad as that guy on the other side of your fence who's crazy and drives you nuts. And you're just as bad as that coworker that you sit next to, right? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. But here's the thing. God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us and that through Christ, through what Christ has done, we can receive forgiveness. We can receive a place in God's family. There's no room for arrogance because you need Jesus just as much as the next guy. Next guy amen? All right. Change your motives. We don't do things to climb up a ladder. We don't do things for pride. We don't do things to be noticed. My goal in life is to fade into obscurity. By the time I die, I hope nobody even remembers me. I don't care. I don't want a toilet named after me. I don't want a room named after me. I don't want my name on a window. I don't, I don't care if I'm ever remembered, but I want everything that I was involved in in the church to be known. Not for me for the kingdom. Change your motives. If you want to be a legacy maker, it ain't about you. It ain't about you. It's about God and it's about the person next to you, but it ain't about you. Change your motives. Secondly, Romans 12 verse 3 says this, for, the, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to. I love Paul. Gosh, I love Paul. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of the faith that God has assigned you. I know that it took a dump truck of grace to get me saved. Maybe two. I don't know. I don't know how to quantify that. I had a revival preacher two weeks ago at Christian Chapel said um, that, uh, that, that, <laughs> that my sin... My sin was what was lashed. God took my sin, and it was lashed across the back of a perfect atoning sacrifice, his son. That my sin was the lash that went across the back. My sin was the nail that went in the foot. That, that was me. I'll never forget when uh, Mel Gibson made The Passion. Um, he never made an appearance in the movie uh, except for one time. One time when Jesus is nailed to the cross, you see a Roman soldier's hand go in with a nail and then he hits the, the nail with a hammer. That was Mel Gibson's hands because he, self, he said he felt responsible for putting Jesus on a cross. We, have to call, we, have to, we are called secondly to act in opposition of our pride. We gotta change our motives. We gotta change why we do what we do, but we also have to realize this. It's not about us. It's not about us at all. It never was. Other than in God's mind, it was always about us. We were the last thing on Jesus' mind before he died. That's the only time it's about us. Everything from that point forward, when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, has nothing to do with you and has everything to do with the kingdom. It's not about getting everything you want the way you want it. It's not about making sure that uh, all the boxes you want checked get checked. It is about the kingdom advancing and us having the privilege to be a part of advancing the kingdom. We hold like Peter and Paul, we hold them up on such a pedestal, rightly so. I mean, he wouldn't like it that we do, but Paul, I mean, we, we adore Paul because what? 
he was a he he was persecuting the church. God restores him. And then what do we know? He spent the rest of his life loving God. And we look at what he's doing and we're like, oh, wow, look at Paul. Guess what? God took you in your sin, redeemed you, and you get to do the same thing Paul was doing. You are walking billboards for the grace of Jesus Christ. I said it a ton. I've heard some of you even say it to me when we talk throughout the years. We are supposed to be Jesus with what? There you go. That's our job. And we can't do that if we're prideful. We can't do that if we're selfish. We can't do that if we're focused inward. We have to be focused on the kingdom. Change your motives, change uh, act in opposition to your pride. Thirdly, we're called to celebrate and utilize the diversity of the church. So in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8 there, it says, For as in one body we have many members, and members do not have all the same function, so we, though are many, are one in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use prophecy, proportion of our faith, service, serving, teaches, teaching, one who exhorts in exhortation, the one who just contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who acts with mercy, cheerfulness. God has given us this huge, big mosaic, and he's pieced it all together with all of these warts and wrinkles that are us. And I'm different than you, and you're different than me, and we have different backgrounds and different personalities, and you guys root for the wrong basketball teams, and we eat different food, and we live in different houses, and we have different numbers of zeros in our bank accounts. We're different, right? We talk different. We act different. We have different pasts. But God brings us all together to make this beautiful mosaic of the church. I said, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life was down at Compassion Church in Savannah, Georgia, they have a big, huge Jesus up on the wall. And you stand back, and you're like, oh, it's Jesus. Well, you walk closer to it, and it is Jesus, but it is individual pictures of the members of that congregation. And they have taken them with some really cool computer program and been able to align it to where it's an image of Christ from a distance. But when you get close to it, you see that Christ is made up of all the little bitty parts and pieces. Whether you're a toenail or a nose hair, you're a part of the body of Christ. Amen? And there are no insignificant parts of the body. In, in eastern North Carolina during peanut season, there is so much dust in the air, it's crazy. I would hate to live in eastern North Carolina without nose hairs. Right? Because they're little filters. They catch all this stuff before it gets up your nose. And, 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 the, and the worst feeling in the world, getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you catch your pinky toe on the clothes basket, the little hole in the clothes basket. Mm -hmm. Some of you always have done that. How bad that hurts, but how much would it hurt more if you didn't have a toenail on there to help blunt some of it? See, we're all parts of the body, and we all have different roles, and we may look different and act different and have even different functions, but we make the one body. It's about the body of Christ. We're called to change our motives, called to act in opposition of our pride, we're called to celebrate and utilize the diversity of the church. Fourthly and lastly, we're called to let our attitude shape our actions. Romans chapter 12, the last uh, four verses there, 9 through 13. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another, showing honor. Ah, I like that one. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. We're called to let our attitude shape our actions. Um, I can sit in a garage and call myself a pink Cadillac all day long, but I'm just a fat guy in a garage calling myself a pink Cadillac. If I want to be that thing, I have to do that thing, right? And if you want to be a believer, if you call yourself a believer, if you claim Christ as Lord and Savior, then it ought to be able to be evident in your actions, in your speech, in the way that you handle one another. The fact of the matter, the church is fluid. COVID proved that, right? It's ever-changing, and the people that come in the doors, I loved it that I saw so many people that I knew, and second under that was my love that I didn't recognize a lot of people because that means new people are coming in the doors. We must be looking for ways to plug folks in to meet the present needs of the church body, but also to use what God has given us, what he's entrusted us with, to be a blessing to, to others that we come in contact with. And beyond that, we must be looking for the church in the future to continue building the legacy that has been handed down to us. 
Valley Mills has got to continue to, to consider practices and ministries that will benefit future generations of worshipers as here, here as well as empowering others to reach out to a world that doesn't know him. I, I serve at a church that's 170 years old. I want to be the guy that kills it at 171, right? I want, to be, I want it to be there for another 170 years or however long it takes before Jesus comes back. But we have to continue that legacy. And if we want to be legacy builders, we have to change everything about us to get it off of us and start looking at Christ. Valley Mills, you know what? It's our job, it's your job, to get people to a place where they can impact their world, but also that they can hand it down to the next person. God's church is active and living just like him. God's church is working and busy just like him. God's church is looking for ways to reach out to the lost and attend to the flock just like him. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up here and we're going to close out. Valley Mills currently has ways for its folks to serve the, the needy and lost and the hurting, feeding the homeless and serving homeless shelters, responding to assist those that have been whacked by Mother Nature. I've been with you when we've gone out to missions trips in a Sholo, Arizona, and other places, and not to mention what's been done locally for those in need through benevolence and charity. I don't, see the, I don't say these things to make you feel good about yourselves or to puff you up. I say them to mo motivate you to continue them, to continue the legacy that God has, has placed in your lap being aware enough to see the need presently, but also being willing to step up and meet that need presently and for the future. I say this to motivate you to continually build the legacy of God's church that he has handed to you. God doesn't want you to do nothing. So the question is, what will you do for the Lord? And what will you do for his church? What will your investment in the kingdom be? And how will you continue the legacy that has been handed down to you? Because, again, legacy is not about an individual. Legacy is about the continued actions of the whole. What will you do to hand down the legacy that has been handed to you? You're going to have a time of invitation today. And during that invitation, I want, to con I want you to consider something. <clears throat> Perhaps you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Today's the day for you to become a part of that legacy. Jesus died for you so that you could find forgiveness and find hope in the family. That you could have a future hope of glory in heaven. If you've never accepted your Lord Jesus as Savior, today come forward. Be obedient to his teachings in the waters of baptism and come out of there ready to continue to build the legacy that you just became a part of. For those of you who have already accepted that legacy, that, 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 uh, the salvation that comes through Jesus and Jesus alone, I want you to consider something. Are you living your life showing what you profess? Because you've got to have the actions to go with the words, right? What are you doing for now and the future? If you need prayer, uh, I know the elders are going to be uh, praying with some folks, and Bob and myself, whoever. If you need prayer today, if you need to make a decision, please come as we, as we have this time of invitation. We do come to a time of invitation. Let's all stand up together. And I want you to know this is not our invitation. It's God's invitation. And there's different things that God might be inviting you to. Um, God might be inviting you right in your seat right now to be reminded of some things you need to start doing or maybe some things you need to stop doing. God might be inviting you to seek purpose and meaning and value in how you spend the time that he has left for you and not chase something that's going to fade away. I was listening as Kurt was preaching and as God was speaking in my heart and mind. And I brought my checkbook today because I hadn't written uh, or through electronic means. I haven't done anything with tithes and offerings the last three pay sessions, and I realized today I need to honor God with the first fruits of what he's given me. 
and I need to go back a little bit and make that right and not just accurately try to just just give a gift I mean let, let's like I don't even care I just want to honor God and and so I wasn't counting all the exactness of it but I knew I was I was off and I needed to honor God so that God's church can be strong here I know today that maybe some of you might need prayer there's a prayer room there's people ready to meet you to just pray about whatever's on your heart whatever you're going through some of you might want to come and accept Jesus and say today's the day I surrender and I let him come in and do what he only can do which is save me and set me on a better course um, some of you this is not just an, an invitation time. If you're like me, every day is an invitation to, to remain close to God, to get closer to God, to figure out how I can leave some kind of legacy. I have no idea how much longer I'll be on the earth. None of us do. So God, help me every day to think about it as I encounter new people, as I work out the things in my life that would prevent me from letting Jesus be seen uh, and help me, God, every day, every day to look. You know, I don't have to have some giant thing. It can be something very small where I just continue leaving legacy. I continue planting the seeds of the gospel of love and grace and truth. Uh, this is an invitation time. It's God's invitation. If you are moved to come forward. We invite you now. Let's sing together.
please be seated. And uh, Tim, if you would come up at this time. Let's... This is Tim Bolin. Uh, he's married to Lori. And uh, Tim, I don't know what others say, and I don't know what people may have told you, but today's the most important day of your entire life. Amen. Amen. You know, you might feel like it's been rock bottom, but God is lifting you out, and he's lifting you up. And this is your family right here, the people of God. Tim comes today to, he's believed in God, but he comes today to totally just surrender to, to God and say, Jesus, I need you. Like, you're not the last thing, you're the only thing. And then you will build your life on Jesus, and he will help you continue to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild, and his grace will be sufficient for you. Tim, I am so excited. I'm touching my heart. It, it, in the midst of difficulty in your life right now, like that springtime flower is blooming out, man. And I'm so excited that uh, as you walk with him every day, um, you're not going to be alone. So, Tim, let me take your confession of faith. If you just repeat after me, okay? I believe, I believe that Jesus is Christ. Let's, let's pray together. Father, as we get ready for Tim's baptism, let it be a reminder, God, that um, Jesus also experienced death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, Father, as Tim comes to be baptized, symbolically, he is experiencing a death to self, a uh, uh, a burial of that old person that you alone can do, God, we can't do it, and that you're, God, you, because of Jesus, are awakening us and rising in us new life. Father, thank you for your amazing grace in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got some other people for prayer, and Craig's going to come up and lead us in that. so many reasons and just dear God people are hurting people are broken and just dear God comfort those who are mourning be with Terry and all their co-workers at McDonald's and just help them to see you and to be comforted and help this family dear God be with Marlo as she navigates this as well Dear God, just help us to see that we have hope in you, and that we don't understand this right now, but you are there, you are our comforter. Help us to come together and to help one another. In your name, amen. Jennifer. Hi there. Several of you in this room have been praying for my husband, Tim, this week with his knee surgery. And I appreciate that. But what I really wanted to tell you is I feel like he has been touched this week. The healing that has taken place. 
place in less than a week's time in our house has been nothing but miraculous. So more important than that, I want to remind you, keep praying. There are prayer warriors in this room. Thank God my mother-in-law is a prayer warrior. <laughs> Take Charlotte with you. She'll pray you through it. But ask your friends. Ask your co-workers. Ask your family. Ask your neighbors. Ask them to pray for you. Ask them how you can pray for them because God is alive and he is working and he is moving in this world and we need to tell people about it. Let's, let's pray and thank God for that. And just <laughs> uh, surgery all went well too. So praise God for that. So let's pray. Dear God, just thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for the great moments and uh, just be with us in those hard moments. And God, just thank you that your, your word is true, that you hear our prayers and that you work in, in miraculous ways and that um, we may not think our prayers reach to you, but they do and, and our prayers are powerful and they work. Uh, dear God, just help us to be encouraged by that. Dear God, keep moving in these people's lives and keep um, healing and keep showing up. Dear God, help us to continue to just wrap around each other and pray and be there for each other because it's more than we could ever imagine that our prayers do for others. In your name, amen. Tim Boland, you come today. You come to say yes to God because God's already said yes to you. You come to surrender.
give a shout of praise to him for all that he is and all he's done for us and all that he continues to do. Yes, God, we love you. I just pray for all of us in this room and those watching online that this week, God, that we would see you working in the midst of all our struggles, all our praises, all the good, all the bad. You never stop working, God. We thank you and we praise you for who you are. You hold the victory, God. Help us to keep our faith and our eyes fixed on you. Help us to remember that we are just a small part of the legacy that will be left. May we finish the race strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us. We hope you have a blessed week. Loving, the dead of night and you tell.